Okay, well, thanks for the opportunity to say a little bit more. Um, so this is going to be very informal um, and very preliminary and uh, hopefully uh, with a lot of discussion. Um, so uh, what I'm going to talk about is basically going to be some implications of this that you've all heard about many times. Okay, so this is the, this is a, the formula of uh, Ryu Takinagi or Hubini Rangamani and Takinagi is the covariant version. Um, and the proposal there is it's a it's a way within the context of ADS CFT to connect the entanglement structure of the state of the CFT with the geometry of dual space-time. And so I wanted to draw, again, this picture that I had from my talk last week. Okay, so this is, this is a way to understand what this formula is doing for you. Okay, so basically what, what this formula does is it gives you a way to, um, you could take any asymptotically ADS geometry <coughs> with some boundary metric. Okay, and then this associates to that geometry some function on the subsets of this boundary geometry. Okay, so, so given this geometry, I could pick any subset A and do this calculation of the extremal surface whose boundary is the same as the boundary of A, and I calculate its area, and that, um, that's what I mean by this function S of A. Okay. Okay, so so there's a couple of points uh, that I want to that become immediately apparent. Okay, one of the points is that the number of these things, the number of asymptotically ADS metrics with boundary B, um, is much smaller than the number of these functions of of subsets of the boundary. Well, of course, they're both infinite, but so this this should be some measure zero set in, in these things. So a way to understand that would be, well, how would I describe one of these space times? Um, it's through some finite, some handful of metric functions, uh, which are functions of, you know, d variables. Okay. Whereas over here, this is a function of Shapes. This this is a function not of not of some finite number of variables, but you can choose any subset of the boundary, um, and this this gives you a number for that. Okay, so the the number of, of functions here um, is this is is huge compared to um, the information here. Okay, and okay, so what's the interpretation of these functions? These functions are telling us about the entanglement structure. Of, so, if, so if there's a if there's a state whose dual is this geometry M, then the, these function this function here is telling us about the entanglement structure of that state. Okay, so one can think of things in this ball as being um, potential entanglement structures, and so what this is showing us is that starting from geometries, you're going to land on a very very special um, subset of these possible entanglement structures. So that's that's the first point that Yutaki Nagi implies that we have highly constrained entanglement structure for holographic states. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how am I supposed to think of the quantum description of the bulk? Right now, it looks like you're associating to you know, sort of classical metrics the quantum state on the boundary. And uh, so, how am I supposed to think of the quantum variables in, in the bulk itself? Uh, is right. this supposed to be, in the end, exact at this level, or am I only working so far? 
sort of semi-classically in the book and make you know approximation? Or yeah. So so good. I should I should have said that. So so really so far uh, in the discussion, I am working at the classical level in the bulk. And um, so if if we want to go beyond that, um, so various people have discussed um, that this formula should be corrected. Um, and so we probably don't know what, what the full thing is. At the semi-classical level, um, then there's some, there's some term which is like the entanglement, the bulk entanglement of fields inside this region with the rest. Well, um, we might even be able to come up with the you know, leading order of correction, but I'm not sure if we really know how to think about the, uh, the correct bulk variables not perturbatively. Uh, I'm pretty sure we don't. Yeah, okay. <laughs> right. so, yeah so that's what we're really driving at. And uh, so then the question is, uh, how we can learn something from... So I want, I want to do something much less ambitious. I mean, so what I want to do right now, so I mean, I, I think we, even at the classical level, um, there are many things to learn. Um, and I, I, I want to get those sorted out uh, first. And then, you know, hopefully that will, it, it, you know, if we get that sorted out, that, that will leave us better prepared to forge ahead into semi-classical and quantum. So. <laughs> So maybe for now we can focus on the, just just this, this classical level um, large n type questions, um, but but hopefully things we learn here will will inform us for our journey into the quantum. Yeah. I have a related question. But yeah. If you just take a superposition of different geometries, then you're exactly like that. So if you take a superposition of different geometries, um, then you are not in here at all. Okay, you might. So, so then you're probably that would that would be one of these things that would be here. Okay, you can calculate entanglement entropies for that state, um, but they're not likely to be reproducible by some single classical geometry. So that's a good example of how you can have lots of states of your CFT, um, which are probably not going to lie in this subspace. Okay, so that's that's kind of yeah, so. So one of the main questions in this talk will be to try to understand better um, in what sense the entanglement structure of these states corresponding to gravity duals uh, would be constrained. OK. Um, so before I do that, I'm gonna, probably most of the talk will end up being on that, although I have a whole part that could be on the other thing. Um, I'll just remind you that not all of these things in here could be entanglement structures. So there are, there are constraints on this function S, um, such as the constraint of strong subadditivity, so, so given regions A and B and C. Well, I could have just done sub subadditivity, but here's strong subadditivity. OK, so, um, so there's a. A separate point, which is that um, only there's some inequalities that constrain functions here that could be allowable entanglement entropies. And so in this whole set of functions of regions, um, only this blue region here, only this blue region there um, is going to be possible starting from a legitimate quantum state. Okay. Now one of the interesting things is that there are geometries for which if I apply the ruch akinagi formula, I end up in this region. Okay. So I could actually, for certain geometries, end up over here. And what that would mean is that that geometry can't possibly be coming from uh, as the gravity dual to some actual field theory state. Okay, so you would you would say that the set of geometries that map into this region would be would be unphysical. Okay, and so so the second part of the talk that I may not get to very much will be um, 
would be you know, characterizing which of these geometries are physical by this criteria. And this, was, this is really telling, you know, it's, so assuming the Ryu-Chakunai formula, it's, it's translating some fundamental constraints in quantum mechanics to constraints on geometries. Okay, this is the thing I mentioned the other day. At the linearized level, um, starting from uh, pure ADS, at the linearized level, this is the thing that gives you um, linearized Einstein equations. And then um, I mentioned that at the nonlinear level, um, some of these constraints seem to translate to certain energy conditions. Yes? Can, can, can you clarify more what do you mean by unphysical? It's like non-unitary, non-local, well, so, yeah. In which way is they are bad? So they're, they're bad. Yeah, OK. So they're, they're bad because, in, in the way I'm driving it, they're bad because um, if there were a quant, if there were a, a field theory state that um, corresponded to that, um, well, they're bad because the entanglement entropies that you would derive from that violate strong subadditivity and other fundamental theorems in quantum mechanics. Okay, on the gravity side, it turns out that um, they also look bad um, by criteria. Well. So at the linearized level, they would not satisfy the linearized Einstein equations. At the nonlinear level, they would be, they would look bad. Some of them would look bad because they would violate certain energy conditions. Okay, so they would violate things that we wouldn't have been able to prove necessarily in the past, um, but now we could actually give an argument for that based on strong subadditivity or some fundamental quantum mechanical thing. So, so, so none of these solutions you can get by solving some supergravity equations from some actual string theory construction. Is that, is that true? Yeah, I mean, the claim would be anything in here, you'd never be able to give a top-down construction of that kind of uh, geometry. You know, you could write down a metric, and you could postulate some matter that violates some energy condition that gives you that metric such that it solves Einstein equations. Um, but th this would be saying, fundamentally, that's ruled out because of this ADSC. Mark, yeah. have, have you checked this at the level of turning on all of the non-gravitational fields <coughs> in some particular, you know, ADS5 cross S5 model, the linearized Einstein part? Oh, the linearized part. Well, I mean, the linear. So the linearized part, if if you have some scalar fields, then you know their contribution to the stress tensor is typically quadratic. So. Um, oh, I see. So, so those not, you can't check it at this level. Yeah, I mean the interesting thing is you can see that stress tensor coming in if you if you're willing to go to the quantum level, um, th then the stress tensor of the matter um, does it appear. It comes in in this correction term. It, yeah, it comes in in this correction term. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Is the claim right now but, the state of our knowledge now that the criterion that you're phrasing for physical coincides with? ones that we would have had before, or is it a subset of? Or well, so the, you know, when you say the ones we would have had before, um, that's fairly up in the air. So people, depending on what they're trying to prove, they choose their favorite uh, energy condition. And there's not necessarily a fundamental um, derivation. Usually you want to choose the weakest one you can and then prove the result. Um, but uh, you, you know, this. so this would be. The hope would be that this this would be picking out some that are definitely true, and they're likely you know in the in the examples that we've worked out they're weaker than um, than either the null energy condition. There, there are some integrated conditions. All the ones that pass, the ones like the, the however you phrase them, would satisfy yours too. It's just a question of whether there is. Yeah. So actually, uh, I mean, one one result that I'll mention. Um, is uh, of Aaron that if you assume the null energy condition, um, then with with some um, you know possibly other global conditions, you, you seem to be able to prove that this is true. Okay. So, um, but but in some cases we can go the other way and say that if this is true, there's some something weaker than the null energy condition that has to be satisfied. But yes. So, so I like like this strong continuity condition is, is like one of the infinitely many conditions and have like many regions like they one. Yes. So, so is, is there like any reasonable kind of a, a description of the space of possible functions S of A which satisfy all these infinitely many conditions? Yeah. So I I mean I don't. So I I just know a finite number of of such conditions and. This is the only unconditional one. So the infinite cone you were talking about, is, 
the ones that are not like this are a lot more complicated, and there's this result of um, Hedrick, uh, Maloney, uh, Hayden, that if you uh, have negative tripartite information, they're all satisfied automatically. No, but that is kind of some, some, some kind of sufficient condition. <coughs> what, what is the like minimal? Mm -hmm. What is it like necessary? So yeah, so. Uh, <coughs> like kill all this condition by some sufficiently strong condition. Right. On the quantum information, that I, I mean, I don't know the answer to what, what would be the, the full set of constraints that, that could be translated to geometry. OK, so, uh, so I want to focus on this direction. I uh, wanted to make some comments about how. Um, how the entanglement structure of holographic straits is constrained. Okay. So I want to think about some state which has a gravity dual M. Okay. Um, so so the first comment I'll make. So I, so I want to make a make a particular statement uh, or a particular set of statements about uh, what these constraints look like from the field theory point of view. Okay. Um, so the first statement is just a plausible statement. I, I won't be able to prove it, but um, or actually many of the statements will, will be plausible. But um, So M um, is defined in terms of some, some metric functions which depend on a field theory coordinate and a radial coordinate. Okay. And so uh, one could ask, well, how much of this entanglement information do I need if I just want to reconstruct the metric? Okay. So one thing I could do is start looking at some special shaped regions. Okay. So I could look at uh, ball-shaped regions of various sizes centered at various points. Okay. So that would be S of B of x and r, okay, and we know it's actually just looking at those ball-shaped regions. Um, it gives us the same amount of information as one of these metric functions, okay. And well, these metric functions sit in some kind of a tensor, um, and so you might think by looking at, um, okay, so that's just <coughs> the same thing in different frames of reference. You might think by looking at ball-shaped regions, the entanglement entropy for ball-shaped regions in different frames of reference, um, I would then have enough information to, uh, to get the metric. Okay. So that statement I know how to do perturbatively. Um, so, so I think perturbatively it's, it's possible to come up with an explicit prescription to do that um, for, for geometries which aren't close to ADS. Uh, I'm just offering it as something that's plausible because these two things have about the same amount of information. Okay. But if you just use Ryutak Yanagi for the ADS geometry, yes. you can reproduce the metric completely. Yeah. Is there any rule for the Diffian Wilkins symmetry on the entropy side of this, or is it just you directly deal with gauge invariant? It's pretty much just talking about gauge invariant things. So, yeah. <coughs> I mean, people have speculated that maybe in, in some kind of tensor network description, the the freedom to define a tensor network might be related to different morphisms. But I, don't, I don't really have any. Comments. Um, okay, so so let's let's see what that implies. So supposing that's true, I calculate the entanglement entropies for these ball-shaped regions. That allows me to get the metric, and then using the metric and Ryutakinagi, I could now get the entanglement entropies for any other region. Okay. Now, the caveat is, well, maybe, maybe there's some limit to um, how far, if, if I have horizons or something, then th there can be, um, there, there can be uh, surfaces where none of these extremal surfaces cross. And so, so there can be limits to how far I can reconstruct the metric. Um, and so I might need to uh, limit, well, how large these regions are. But I could choose any shape. Okay, so the, the claim would be... even without a horizon. Pardon? It, 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 yeah, it could could happen uh, even without horizons, as you uh, and and that I, I mean, guess. And there's explicit the constructions other people did too, like right. conical singularity. And That's right. So so, but 
even so, um, if, I, if I just get in a little ways from the boundary, then there's a, a huge number of things that I get for free. Um, and so this, the statement of this constraint seems to be that knowing the, for a holographic state, um, knowing S for balls gives S for arbitrary regions. Okay, so that's um, that's that's a fairly um, so that's a field theory statement that gives you an idea of how constraining this entanglement structure is. Okay, and that so that didn't make use of any kind of bulk equations. Um, yeah. Do you have to make any assumptions about the topology of your boundary, other than maybe simply connected? I mean, can it be some higher um, genus nasty thing? And well, I yeah, I mean, balls I think, can't feel kind of global topology structure. So I, I just had in mind the Cauchy space or a sphere or something, okay. but um, um, yeah, if, if I had so some other boundary geometry. Boundaries basically topologically a sphere. Well, if I had some other topology, then I mean the statement would probably change that. You know, I can make a more general statement that the that the um, entanglement entropy for regions of some particular shape with one size parameter would be enough to reconstruct uh, other entanglement. These theorems would tell you if it's not simply connected, you expect that topology to be behind horizons. So. Well, he's talking about the boundary geometry, not the boundary. He's talking about the boundary geometry. So, so again, you know, there's probably some metric that you could reconstruct some ways in, knowing this limited set of information, and then you could use that metric to get a bunch of other entanglement entropies. Okay. Um, okay, so that wasn't, here we didn't assume any any bulk equations. We, we simply took took the information about an entanglement for the balls and uh, deduced a metric, and then we got uh, and then we got entanglement entropy for other regions. Um, yeah, presumably, right. Presumably, if everything is consistent, if we started with a consistent state, then they would satisfy bulk equations. Um, so so we can actually say more. I mean, say we're talking about n equals four super Yang Mills, and we're pretty sure what the bulk equations are. Um, and then we can say uh, a little bit more. OK, so, so in this case, uh, we don't even have to look at anything as fancy as balls. Um, we could basically just look at infinitesimal regions at points. Um, so as uh, Don was saying last week, uh, in his talk, um, assuming this, if I just know uh, local data, so I, I I know the expectation values of the set of operators that are dual to bulk fields, so this would be um, e.g. t mu nu and other operators. Um, that are dual to any of the, any fields that might be turned on. Okay. Well, then this gives me this basically gives me the asymptotic behavior of all of my bulk fields, and then I could just use the bulk equations of motion. And as Don was describing, um, I should be able to integrate in some distance. Um, to get a metric. Okay. Perhaps you, you know. Again, again, I may want to assume that the state that I'm talking about actually has a, a dual geometry. So, so I might worry that I could, if I just started with these one-point functions, that problem might not be well defined. But, yeah. So about the comment you, uh, the thing you were talking about holographic space. Yeah. Do you think it's, it would be plausible to say you start with a field theory? That's large n, mm -hmm. and argue see such a property just from point of view field theory. <coughs> so that in a large, large well, yeah, well, let's let's we'll 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 I'll I'll say more. Maybe postpone that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So so assuming these, and then starting with these, you use your equations of motion, 
And then you can, you can get, you know, again, maybe just to some limited distance, but you could integrate in and find um, what I'll call MO. So this is a geometry which is, this is a, a, a geometry which is consistent with uh, these expectation values. Okay. Um, and then you can do the same thing. And starting with MO, then you could get, for example, all the, all the entanglement entropies for non-local regions. Okay, or, or other kind of non-local observables. Um, so roughly speaking, it seems like the, what, what this is saying is that for holographic states, the entire entanglement structure um, is determined by local data. So I'll write down a, a couple of explicit formulas that show you how that could work. Sorry, okay. It's more than local data, right? It's local expectation values. It's well, local, local. You don't even need to know operative product coefficients, right? This would be just expectation values, and actually just a limited set. Uh, <laughs> just a limited set. I, I really only need to know the ones that would correspond to these light fields in the bulk that might be involved in the solution. So and, you know, if I if I were restricting further to just vacuum solutions of Einstein, then all I would need to know would be the stress tensor expectation value. Okay, so let me give an example of how how this works. Um, so actually, at the perturbative level, there's a formula um, that at the perturbative level this turns out to be true. Um, for ball-shaped regions in any CFT. Okay, so this is this is just a useful thing to have in mind um, because it um, it's an explicit formula, and this is for small perturbations around the vacuum state. Um, we know that actually uh, you can you can determine the entanglement entropy of a of a ball-shaped region. Um, in terms of the stress tensor expectation value by doing this integral. Okay, so that would be kind of the kind of thing um, that, that this is implying, except that you know, this was restricted to small perturbations around the vacuum state, and it was restricted to ball-shaped regions. Um, but this would be saying that you could do this for any region, that you, know, you could, that S for any region. Um, there should be a formula like this um, where maybe Normally, I could I could maybe write a expansion in terms of the number of times you need to use that expectation value, and um, maybe you know, maybe there's a non-perturbative version of this as well. But that so this is basically the kind of thing uh, <coughs> that. Ryutakinagi implies that the holographic states are states where I could write the entanglement entropy just in terms of these local things. Okay. Excuse me, Mark? Yeah. I heard a comment from Costas Kanderas once, which might be relevant here, okay. about, about which states do you expect to have a holographic yeah. you know, dual. Okay. And his point was simply that you know we know that, that typically these field theories have a, a a few low dimension operators and then a gap, and yeah. most of the operators have very high dimension. Right. And he was suggesting that the states with holographic duals are simply ones in which the one point function of all the higher dimension operators is zero, or essentially small. Mm -hmm. and, and only the, the low dimension operators have non zero one point function. Yeah, I think that's probably, n uh, I think there are probably states like that that don't. I'll mention one in a, in a minute. Oh, okay. but. Um, okay. So you think that, that's not enough or not? Well, that, I mean, that's, yeah, that sounds like a good, that sounds like, so if, if I have really heavy operators turned on, that could tell me that I have uh, kind of non-geometric things happening. Yeah, kind of but, curvature. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, in general, well, yeah, let me, it's kind of the next thing I wanted to say. So this is the, this is the next point. So, Mark, you're not saying that we know what these k's are. No, yeah. I, I, well, you know, I could calculate these k's 
for, okay, so, so given Einstein's equations with some matter, um, I, if I worked hard enough, I could calculate those. So this is just solving the nonlinear equations given some sources. So these are just ordinary kind of. Yeah, I'm just wondering whether. I have a graduate student that's calculating one of these. <laughs> if you said that whatever this is, since it's something in the conformal field theory, it's going to be given by you know, some expression involving multipoint functions. Wh wh whatever you know, the k is? Whatever s a is. Oh, yeah. It'll be given by some expression involving all the Green's functions mm -hmm. of all the operators. Mm -hmm. And if you, again, assume you, you can throw away all the operators of high dimension and you just look at the operator product expansion, you can reduce everything to products of expectation values, can't you? If you know the conformal products um, and the operator product coefficients and all of that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think in print one, one would like to be able to do that. I'll, I'll get back to that kind of question at the end. Okay. Um, but, but I was claiming that this should only be true for holographic states. So, so there, I, you, I don't think thing. it's a, I don't think it's a CFT formula. Yeah. Last thing is not local. Oh yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I should. Right. Oh, it's it's. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Not arbitrarily. Um, oh. That's exactly what the OPE was. What you have. All right, so this is the question. Um, OK, so this is an interesting thing, that holographic states apparently have this property that knowing this limited amount of local data, I could really get a lot of the, uh, the non-local stuff. I could get this entanglement structure. Um, and so now I want to ask, um, well, as, as we've already been asking um, in some of the questions, um, um, you know, so in one of these holographic CFTs, how special or general um, are the states for which this works? And then the second question is, uh, can we understand some field theory principle that would allow us to start with this local data and then um, like generate a state or generate um, all kinds of all kinds of non-local information. So what field theory principle would allow us to calculate um, like these entanglement entropies from local operator expectation values? I have it so so in, you know implicitly um, for this to be true, I should be talking about some holographic the theory, and I should be talking about a state that has a gravity dual. Um, so if I wanted to, <coughs> to derive this directly from CFT, I would presumably need to use a bunch of stuff. Um, but so far, this is just a gravity prediction for something that should be true. This is sort of a, again, a necessary condition if you have some sensible bulk dual and you're not really quite addressing the question of reconstructing the, the bulk at this point, right? Um, right? I took that to be sort of an easy question. I mean, right. the, the reconstruction, my, so my statement was that I just calculate a bunch of these entanglement entropies yeah. and, um, and then there's some prescription. At the classical level, maybe. I'm, yeah. I'm just at the classical level, okay. yeah. Yeah. Uh, can, can, can I clarify something? Sorry, I'm very confused right now about yeah, that. Yeah, sorry. So, so if, as maybe very, I think probably everyone understood exactly. But it's, so the way you're getting it, you are getting expectation by local operator, then you get a metric from there, and then you go back to your Takinagi. Yes. Right, but is it obvious why I only need local expectation values, some Wilson loops, and don't you want to know? To get to get the metric? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So sorry. this this has to do right. Good. So so this is. Um, Involves some ADS CFT lore that um, so in the in the bulk um, so you have various fields like the metrics uh, scalar fields etc right and um, so in order to use the equations of motion to understand what those are I need some boundary conditions over here and one of the boundary conditions would just be um, 
So the, the bound, so let's just focus on the metric. One of the boundary conditions is just the boundary geometry. And then the other boundary condition, it turns out, um, is related. So if, if I know the stress energy tensor expectation value in the field theory, that gives me the remaining information um, that allows me to then integrate the equations. Okay, so that's, yep, yeah, that was a. And uh, just maybe, maybe slightly a question. Yeah. Do we know how to get the modular Hamiltonian knowing just this expression value? Of, because that's much more. That's not well, uh, yeah, I mean, okay. Spectrum so and the. I'll, I'll okay. postpone that. Okay, so this, this is going back to, uh, to Gary's question now. Um, okay. So in the field theory, um, there should be many states with the same um, expectation value of these operators, just because that's a very limited, it's much less information than, than um, specifying a field theory state. Um, and so as you asked, you know, it's an actual <laughs> question just to say which are, which are holographic. Okay, so I think an example um, where, okay, I mean an example of, of, of a state that I would claim, you know, has these, has these expectation values but doesn't really have a gravity dual would be something where I kind of, um, just enforce that there's no long range entanglement at all. So, so for example, if I, if I took a state that's like a tensor product of, of uh, density matrices, so, so say I divide up my space, and, um, and then I take a state that's, that's roughly a, a tensor product of dense, density matrices. Okay, we have to, there's some regularization Right. Concerns, then the but, stress sensor but, would be singular, right? Yeah, well, uh, okay. So it wouldn't be smooth. Yeah, it would. Okay, so that's true. It'd I be don't sing, think this singular, works singular. in general. I think you can you can consider examples like states that have negative energy in one region and positive energy mm -hmm. in the other region, and you can figure out that the only way it's uh, this is consistent, why you couldn't just glue two negative energy things together and get a state with lower energy than the vacuum mm -hmm. is precisely because long range entanglement enforces some non trivial constraints onto mm -hmm. these operators. Yeah, I mean, so, okay. I guess I don't have a, yeah, I don't have a really sharp answer. I mean, I would have, I would have said, like, in, in, a, in any kind of regulated model, um, I, I could have done this. So if, if I had if I had a like a, a lattice, then I certainly could construct lots of states that would preserve those one point functions, um, but wouldn't um, wouldn't have any of the long range structure. So so would have completely different entanglement entropies at long range. Um, but you're allowed to know this local data at all times, right? Yeah. So what if I claim that at least in the you know, finite end field theory? Knowing all those local expectation values completely determines the state. I mean, well, uh, yeah, we're, I mean, true, we're, but it's, I, I, mean, I don't know. It's the the well. thing that I'm getting to actually is is something that suggests that a lot of these states really are holographic. So, yeah. So, I don't want to spend too much time. But are you distinguishing the low dimension and high dimension operators in your discussion? Or I was I was talking about O's that would be dual to just these light. I mean, the, light just the fields that are involved in, in the gravity. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I thought it was kind of obvious, but so so just because that's a tiny set of information, I thought it it's sort of clear that there'd be lots of states. Um, well, okay. This is yeah. This is, I mean, I guess I guess the question is really, um, how many? Yeah, it depends how many O's you have in conformal field theory. The LPE lets you express any product of operators in terms of, of another one, and so you can reduce any product of operators to a bunch of C number coefficients 
times a single one. Sorry, I'm being really slow. If I just uh. think of harmonic oscillator, right? Like it, it's, its expectation value is zero, but it can have a variance of expectation value of x squared that is determined by the, the state, and but those are all well, different. But this is a no. I mean, this is being put that the integral under one over n is all correlated to factor i. Yeah. Um, no, it's a question of the state, right? It's not. No, no, but you can set up I mean, a state so which overcomes that. But you know, just compute this correlation. You know, okay, here's. And then take the boundary limit, and in the bulk, it's clear that they are all factorized. Maybe, maybe, maybe I can construct one state for you. <laughs> <laughs> it's in holodomor. I thought you said it's that. It's not holodomor. Well, so, yeah, so, okay. But so you had examples that couldn't be holographic because they were superpositions. Yeah, I, th I think that's right. I mean, I think I could take a state which, like, a, I think I could just take, um, you know, if I had a bunch of, of stress tensors, states and with different stress tensors, but, but they all added up to uh, a certain final stress tensor. And then I took, uh, so, so take t mu nu 1 and t mu nu n and add them up. And then you get the stress tensor t mu nu. And now I consider a state which is just the, the you know, diagonal density matrix um, corresponding to you know, a bunch of different geometries. So, so then that density matrix has a certain um, stress tensor expectation value, um, but the, the state doesn't really have a, a dual geometry. There's, it's just a, a superposition of some finite number of completely different geometries. So I think that would be a, a, an example. Are you fixing anything else about the state, like the energy? Well, if I fix all of the one point, five, yeah, I mean, the knowing, the, the, knowing the stress tensor, I would, yeah. Yeah, yeah. OK. But still, that's Yeah. So like, do we assume that this state is time independent? No. So, uh, so that's that, that, that a follow-up question. So, so usually, like, people in, in, in like, this tensor network, they typically discuss like, how to construct quantum states which have low and tangible energy. That's, that, that's what, what tensor networks are good for. But they, they say that the typical problem is when you time evolve it, then the amount of entanglement grows linearly with time. So, so the problem is that if you start with some state which was previously had like a small amount of entanglement right. entropy and evolve with time, it typically has high amounts of entanglement entropy. And that's why it might not be holographic anymore. So, so like it's a... Uh, well, I mean, presumably for holographic states, that wouldn't happen. I mean, the, like the vacuum, if you start with a vacuum state, then the entanglement entropy is. Well, but if you, I mean, if you had any, I mean, if you have any, any kind of solution of Einstein's equations and. But if you start with a very highly excited state, it might be very well happen. Sure. I, and you don't have any constraint here. On what okay, so. Energy. Yeah, let's let's just take a step back and remember what I'm what, what where we're at. So so really, all I was saying, I wanted to ask this question. Okay, and I think the only point that I wanted to make at this point was that it's not obvious that all states are holographic. Okay, so I think this example is a decent example of a state where I would calculate these one-point functions, um, and yet the there's there's no um, sense in which that state is dual to a particular geometry. Okay, that's kind of all I wanted at that point. Okay, so given that we have at least one um, state that doesn't have a holographic dual, then, um, it, you know, it's, it's a less trivial question. Um, so now we have, the, you know, there could be just a few states with a holographic dual or, or many or most. Okay. Okay, so let's do an example. So there's an example where I can answer the question. Um, okay, so my example is is this case where I have t zero zero, and it's equal to some constant, independent of time and space. And all the other one-point functions are zero. And well, I mean, I guess the you know by in, in the conformal field theory, the TII has to be equal to that. Oh. Um, 
But I don't, yeah, I, I want to set, say, all the scalar operator one point functions to zero, right? So this, this of course, is just, this would be, um, in this case, my M, O, is going to be the black hole. Okay, or black brain, or depending on which geometry we're talking about. Okay. Um, okay, and now we would we would normally say that that black hole uh, geometry is dual to a thermal state. Okay. Um, however, okay, we would also expect that any microstate, any typical state in this ensemble. Okay, would also um, would also have a dual geometry that looks like that black hole. Okay, so so we expect any typical state ensemble. Um, should look like the black hole because the for almost uh, for, for most observables, unless you look at really complicated observables, um, the answer f for their expectation value would be the same as in this um, in this ensemble to very high accuracy, and probably exactly in, in this large end limit that we're working in. Okay. Okay. So we expect that these states should agree um, for most observables, and therefore. Um, be holographic, okay, and and sort of dual to something that that basically looks like M. Okay, so that's kind of interesting. We would conclude is that is exactly M. Yeah, M up. So, so again, M was was kind of the part of the geometry that I could reconstruct by by integrating in from the boundary, and and so it wouldn't include what's at or past the horizon. Um, so when I'm saying that it's dual to M, I just mean that it has, um, say, entanglement entropies that are consistent with areas in this part of the geometry that I was able to reconstruct outside the horizon. Outside the horizon. Yeah. Okay. But I, yeah, I'm happy to call it holographic if. If there's this nice space time up until the horizon, and then we don't know what happens there. Okay. Okay. So, so this is this is uh, interesting. I mean, I think this is a point Don also made in his talk last week that that you know apparently in this example, um, most states with oh, I called it T zero zero. Uh, most states with this particular uh, specification of one point functions are holographic. Okay. And so there's a way to understand that. Why, so why is this another way to say why this is true is that this ensemble here is the on, it's the ensemble of states that maximizes the entropy, the von Neumann entropy, um, with the constraint that you have a particular energy. Okay. And since you've defined it by maximizing the entropy, then you expect that most of the states um, um, are going to um, be in there. Okay. Okay. So that's. You're saying even if you had a huge variance in T not So yeah, I'm saying that those states would be very special. Like there could be, there are definitely states with a big variance, um, but I, I would say that those states we would expect are not typical states in this set of all states with. Yeah. Anyway, I I think this is not totally. Like, I think I've gone back and forth between like okay. should should. So what do you mean you by the very coarse graining yeah. before you can even talk about that question, right? T naught naught is an operator that has arbitrarily high frequencies in it, and so you can expect to get the variance right unless you've coarse grained it enough. The thermal the expectation the value teaser. will not mm -hmm. agree with the expectation value in some microstate. If I look at every single component of T naught naught, every single frequency component, right? 
It's only some, well, uh, some so coarse grained version of the let's algorithm. Let's see. I mean, if, if I just do the vacuum, subtract. I mean, I'm, I'm not worried about the vacuum I'm not energy. Worrying, but I'm not talking about the expectation value. I'm talking about the variance. So if you took a typical so the variance, there's a oh, the, calculation okay. of what the variance is in mm -hmm. the thermal ensemble, mm -hmm. and that's right. But I think it's only right for the coarse grain version of T naught naught. Why do you say that? Oh, I don't understand. What? I mean, the, you're worried about the fact that there are ultraviolet issues. It sounds like, but you know, the ultraviolet modes are going to be in there. I'm, I'm worried about the fact that statistical mechanics doesn't get the microscopic details of states correct. Irrespective of whether I have a UV cutoff or not. What about quantum field theory statistical mechanics? Quantum field theory statistical mechanics doesn't work any differently than statistical mechanics in any other quantum mechanical system. What do you mean it doesn't get the microscopics right? Sorry? If I, have a, if I have a system that satisfies the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. The eigenstate thermalization hypothesis yeah. has a specification of which operators you're allowed to look well, at. Actually, Sure, it specifies it exactly, but it says yeah. it's a limited class. It's a limited right? class of operators. The microscopic stress tensor is not one of those operators. It's got matrix elements between arbitrarily separated uh, energy eigenstates. I mean, it's a local operator in quantum field theory. Yeah. It has the, you can't cut off its matrix elements and keep it local. The hard part of that is the ultraviolet, and the state is going to be in the vacuum of the ultraviolet. So why does this cause any problems? The expectation value of the stress sensor in the vacuum has UV divergences. Yeah, okay. which are universal to all states, and match that of the thermal state. I think I'll allow myself to proceed. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, yeah, let me, so where, where were we? Um, so it's interesting, at some point, so we'd ask this question of what, what kind of field theory principle um, would have allowed us to do this, um, um, achieve this miracle of, of getting all kinds of uh, entanglement entropies from just knowing um, these, these one-point functions, okay? And well, we just did an example, and somehow there, um, the miracle was just that we, we maximized entropy. So we, we took the maximum entropy ensemble consistent with the one-point functions, and then um, if you calculate the entanglement entropies and so forth uh, in that ensemble, well, it's going to match with the typical states in that ensemble. And so, you know, the holographic states are just these typical ones in this entropy maximizing ensemble. And so, um, so it seems interesting to just try to generalize that. Um, so can we define, um, so I want to define a state um, which... I'm really sorry to deliver this, but you're saying this couldn't be in this many-body localized phase that you can talk about as, a, as the alternative? I, I don't think I can answer the question. What do you mean? The, the in that case, they're disordered. Yeah, well, okay. I, I should. In this case, he has translation. Well, those cases, I, I, this is from the couple of field theory. Are you, use, are you deriving the statement in the field theory without using any gravity? Well, I, I, think, I think really all I, I'm just kind of using standard. I mean, this, this is pretty standard in terms of thinking about black holes that, you, you black know. Black holes, you're using the gravity side. That's fine. If you're. Um, yeah, so, so I mean, I'm making a statement about what you would find if you calculated entanglement entropies in this state. And I can calculate those things in, like, in t I guess in one plus one dimensions, I know how to calculate those. But I mean, I'm saying, like, I, I've asked Mark, maybe you've changed, but he, I tried to ask him before, other Mark, whether. So I don't think we can take the thermal state. Is known in the angle theory, say? Is this known to be true? And you, in two dimensions, the FD is yeah. how Mark can calculate the entanglement entropy of primary states, and they do <coughs> match the thermal state. Yeah, in 2D, we can the do dimension. this calculation. I don't, we can't take the thermal state of n equals 4 on a sphere and actually calculate the entanglement entropy for a ball. Okay. So far, I mean, we, we could. 
we can hope to do that numerically. But yeah. yeah. So so I'm I'm I am I am appealing to some um, uh, intuition from gravity. <coughs> And, and I will continue to do so um, as I generalize this. So, I mean, so the natural, so, so if I want to generalize this, we can ask, well, okay, say someone gives me now a bunch of expectation values. Um, I could consider a state rho O, which maximizes um, the entropy subject to these constraints that we have the right expectation values. Okay. Um, this kind of state was considered recently um, by Aaron and, and Will. And actually also, um, there was this paper by Swingle and Kim and um, talking about these, these, these kind of entropy maximizing states recently. So, um, so they'd shown up, and, and, but it's, and it's, it seemed to me that maybe this is a natural um, thing to just generalize um, this thing. So, uh, so you can even write uh, a formula. So, so if I want to do that maximization problem, I write down trace of row log row, and I introduce some Lagrange multipliers, and then I have uh, trace of row oi minus oi. <laughs> and then you do the uh, maximization, and you can even write down the answer, and it looks like um, some this. Okay, so it, it, it's a formal answer because it requires us to say what these lambdas are, <coughs> and um, so we would need to vary over these lambdas and Is calculate the x. Uh, this here. Yeah, it involves O's at different points. Oh, yeah, but it's just a sum. Those the expectation values? Yeah. No, no. The, so this is a sum of operators. Yeah. So there's no um, ordering necessary um, in the exponent. Oh, I see. OK. It's just it's the exponential of the time integrated thing. Yeah. OK. OK. So it's not the usual thing that we derive time ordered from. Yeah. So OK. I mean, so so this, OK. So this is a very formal expression. Um, so is, 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 I, the, is the energy density one of your O's or no? Yeah. OK. Yeah. Yeah. So, so in this case, we would have found that most of the lambdas are zero, and that, and that um, the the one in front of um, the one in front of the energy density would be beta. Okay. And um, okay. All right. So this, so at least formally, um, this defines for us a state. It's the, it's the entropy maximizing state that agrees with all of these one point functions. Okay. Okay, and then and then we could just so as a guess or a suggestion, um, we could say that well, like like this one here, we might guess that that this is a natural thing to be holographic, and the theta is are restricted to what kind of Oh. Oh, the, these operators again are the operators that would correspond to the light fields in the bulk. So, so they would include the stress tensor, um, but also some scalar operators or currents if you had gauge fields. But single trace operators? Yeah, I mean, um, typically I would I would have single trace operators dual to my light light bulk fields. Okay, so so a guess generalizing this would be that this is an example of a state uh, that's that's holographic and and dual to this geometry that I I got using the gravity. Um, but again, it follows because we did this ent entropy maximization um, to get this. Um, if if that's true, that would suggest that, or that would imply that typical states. In this ensemble, are holographic, and you know again dual to M, and and that um, 
they, their observables to very high accuracy agree with the, um, the observables in this state. And so if you did the calculations needed to deduce the geometry, you would get the same answers. Yes? Uh, so, like, is it possible that, that such states are normalizable at all? Because really, in the first example, yeah. you have like some positive energy stuff, and your states have positive energy. So that's why it's possible <coughs> that, that you can normalize such like e to the minus fifth age. Yeah. But here, with the general OI, so it may have some uh, complicated spectra, and such state might not be even normalizable. And might not be a part of yeah. So okay. So that's that's a good question. I mean, at least at, at least. So remember, one of these o, OIs in general is my um, is my stress tensor. Okay. So it should yeah, so in general have some terms like this that suppress really high energy stuff. Um, so yeah. So I mean, this is a very good question. I don't it, I don't really understand. So another question is whether you know whether we really need the integral over T here, in this case, um, that, you know, this this basically is at a particular yeah. time, so, so, and, and so you you could imagine that um, the properly defined states here, lambda, would be some distribution that that you, you know yeah. restricts to some particular finite time. Another possible candidate would be just take like set, set the i minus whenever some trace and square it. So instead of instead of doing like quadrilateral multiplier, you can just have some kind of something which is like Okay. Yeah. I mean, there are other proposals, but I mean, this one seems to seem to be the most natural generalization. But um, you know, in thermodynamics, we so don't have we don't consider arbitrary ensembles of over you know, integrals of local. Yeah. Th well, this is not a standard. Yeah, I, I mean, I just said, well, what's the maximum entropy thing that's consistent well, with the knowledge with what I know? Yeah, but that works for the energy. We know that. But does it work for scale? Well, I would. I mean, I I was suggesting that because energy is part of that. Um, that you, I mean, if I thought about this as as a perturbation away from from this kind of state, that maybe it's sensible. I mean, this is I. I certainly need to spend time understanding how how um, sensible this is. But especially, it looks like it's you know. The, over space and time, it looks like you have too much that you know yeah. contradicts the equations of motion. Well, so so that I mean, in just in quantum mechanics, you know, if if you give me these and you guarantee that they're consistent with some actual state, then this construction will give you an answer which is which is consistent. So it, you know, in cases where where everything is well regularized, sure. if you gave me something that that didn't correspond to any state. Then this will not. So this, make sense. this formula works for the harmonic oscillator. I did that. Uh, I, well, maybe I checked it for a spin <laughs> or something. So <laughs> I mean, th there are cases. It, it, you know, if 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 you give me um, some consistent things, it, yeah, this is just a very general formula. It just, so it, yeah. I'm confused about what these states should look like if there's no horizon. So in the case there's a black hole, I can say, well, this is counting something about the various microstates of yeah. the black hole. If there's no horizon, I'm trying to think, what would this class of, how would these class of states actually differ in the bulk? The only thing I can think of is well, maybe they would differ in the yeah. quantum, in these small quantum fields so could be only one state. The yeah. So actually, what what Swingle and Kim recently proved, um, they they were considering time independent things, um, but what they recently proved was that. Um, if you have a local Hamiltonian, um, and yeah, I mean basically, if what were they? they? They had some result like if if you had a local Hamiltonian and you considered uh, you were trying to match um, expectation values of operators restricted to some. Finite region, so I don't think the operators necessarily had to be local, but in the continuum limit they would. Um, that this procedure actually, uh, so so if if you're this would reconstruct the ground state exactly. So if you if you have a ground state of a local Hamiltonian, and then someone gives you these expectation values, and then you do this procedure that it it could reconstruct a unique state, and that would that would be. Um, 
something where some of these parameters, that would be a little bit of a singular limit where, say, beta would go to infinity, right? If beta goes to infinity, you get the ground state. So but isn't it obvious? I mean, if the stress tensor is zero, yeah. that's one of your constraints. There's only one state satisfying that. So yeah, it should just give you, state. yeah, that's right. In that case, it should just give you the ground state. So it could be that this, this whole thing is degenerate to an ensemble of one thing. And in that case, you wouldn't have to ask the question of, of how the states differ in the bulk. But in general, it could be that there's a horizon. I mean, if I have an energy density everywhere on Minkowski space, then there could be a horizon. And you know. Okay, I propose we give Mark some uh, uninterrupted time to reach a logical stopping point. OK, yeah, I need like just two minutes. So. Oh, OK, and then we can. Uh, yeah, so let me do that. Um, um, so OK, I mean, this is all you know, admittedly very preliminary. Um, but, so, but I think. If so, if if something like this is true, um, this would this would be suggesting that m most of the states that, like for this example over here, that actually maybe most of the states um, um, consistent with these one-point functions um, are holographic. Okay, for these you know for these large n theories um, and. Okay, so coming back, so how, how could we could we test this somehow? Okay. Okay. So again, if it's right, it gives us a field theory prescription to calculate um, the entanglements. So so again, the prescription would be, you know this local data, you do this entropy maximization, you take this state, and then you calculate. Um, the entanglement entropy is using, using this. Um, and that would be the answer. And then what, you need, what you'd need to do is check that that kind of thing, uh, that answer agrees with that formula that I wrote down from gravity. OK, um, okay so yeah, I, I don't need to write that down. OK, so I, you know, I, think, I think there are various ways you could, so one could try to do that calculation in some context. Um, I would like to understand, you know, what's known since apparently these kinds of entropy maximizing states have been considered in the literature, um, at least in the time independent case. I would like to understand what's known about, say, the entanglement structure of those states. I mean, is it is this consistent with uh, the kind of structure that we expect from gravity? Um, final comment was, you know, if uh, in in some of the Recent ADS CFT literature, people have been interested in in the same question of what what kind of structure um, do holographic states have? People have been talking about this code subspace, um, you know, that that you need to be able to uh, that that bulk information has to be encoded um, in the in the in the boundary in in, a, in sort of redundant copies. Um, I think this this gives an interesting um, point of view on that. You know, it's saying that well, maybe most states are actually in this code subspace, which, which is surprising if you thought the code subspace had to be small. Um, but I think it's it's clear how that could work because um, you know your states here are specified by just a, a small number of operator expectation values, and so um, so if I wanted to know uh, now, now, given some other operator O bulk, okay. um, if I wanted to know the expectation value of O bulk, um, I basically would just need to know um, where, so going back to my original diagram, all I need to know is where on this, where on this space I am. Okay. And this set of one-point functions I'm claiming is one way to tell me where on this space I am. Okay. But presumably, <coughs> any other set of sufficiently large set of operators would also allow me to tell me, allow, allow me to figure out where on this space I am. Okay. So I think naturally, you know, in this, in this case where, where really just a, a limited set of data is determining where you are, um, it's natural that there'd be a lot of redundant ways to figure out uh, the same bulk information. Okay, so I'll stop there. Okay. I think we can take a few questions.
need to give people time to get over to the close. But uh, question? Yeah. I'm a little confused about this construction. So say I have an operator and I know I have a ward identity that says well, there's a conservation identity. So what happens if I plug in beds that don't satisfy Gauss's law or conservation of energy? Does, does something in this construction break down or? Yeah, presumably something goes wrong. I mean, I, I'm only interested in the case where, um, where, where I have um, some information that's consistent with, um, like, that, that would actually be coming from a state. But I mean, the, um, the reason I ask is that in ADS-CFT, we know that you know, conservation of the stress tensor is a consequence of Einstein's equations in the bulk you know, when you do some Trefferman gram expansion near the boundary. So it's, you know, I'm, I'm curious where well, those types of things are. You also follows from field theory. I mean, pardon? It, I mean, you say the lambdas are defined implicitly by some equation that you get the right expectation back. And if you're trying to do something yeah, that violates a conservation law in the field theory, exactly. there ain't no such lambda. This is a state, okay. and it we satisfies. Zero probability is what should happen. Well, yeah. I mean, this is yeah. this okay, is a good. state, That's and you know, so it must satisfy all properties that states satisfy. Okay, good. Yeah. I'm a bit confused by what, what you gain by writing down this row. I mean, so you started okay. out with the expectation values, and then you construct the metric. And so what, what are you saying? Yeah, what, I mean, what this would do for you, this gives me a field theory prescription. So I, I give you a gravity prescription for calculating this from this. And I said, well, that's, that's kind of a funny thing from the field theory point of view, that someone would hand you just local expectation values, and then suddenly you'd be, be able to calculate all these entanglement entropies. But I've just given you now a field theory prescription that would allow you to do the same thing. You give me, I get the expectation values, I do this entropy <coughs> maximization, now I have a state, now I can compute in principle using that state all the entanglement entropies, okay? And then an interesting check would be to see whether that prescription agrees with the gravity prescription. Right, but exactly here. So this, this field theory prescription is very generic. It works for, for, for infinitely class of theories which don't have holographic view. So why should I? Why should I even? Oh well, okay. So good. So so we don't only expect it to agree with that gravity prescription in the case of holographic duals. Okay. So the the no, step would be, given a theory that I think is holographic, mm -hmm. now can I take this and directly calculate using these special properties of my holographic CFT? Can I do the calculation? And uh, if I can, hopefully um, I would find something that agrees with the, the gravity answer. In other cases. Um, I would not find anything that agrees with the gravity answer. And I should emphasize that there's lots of different gravity answers depending on which equations of motion I'm talking about. And so depending on which field theory um, you're talking about, if it's holographic, you know, hopefully I'd be able to use th these properties of the holographic field theory, maybe you know, OPEs or, or constraints on the spectrum. But, but this too, I mean, yeah. uh, it, it seems pretty obvious that this is a much bigger set of theories which satisfy this. For example, if, a, a, any, a, any, any yeah. theory which has some conserved laws. So there, in the first case, the energy was conserved, so you get E to minus beta H. If you have more conserved laws, you get this generalized Gibbs ensemble. Yeah, like yeah, but, but the, your, I mean, th this is just true that, that in a field theory, right. if you maximize the entropy right. with these constraints, and this is the state. But the thing that would the thing that would not be true in general would be that if I take this and then calculate S A, okay. In general, it would not be true that that answer could be reproduced using a gravity prescription. I agree. Yeah. So that would be the that would be the non-trivial. That's the non-trivial part of this kind of guess that if you actually define this state in a holographic CFT and did this calculation that that would actually agree with a gravity calculation. Right. So that, yeah, that's, that's sort of the non-trivial thing. Though. Right, but that seems as, as, as hard as asking the question which theory sets by gravity without even knowing this. It doesn't seem to, at least I. Well, I mean, if, if I could simulate, I mean, it, you know, if, if I had power to, uh, if I had power to, to do calculations directly in, in one of these holographic theories, which is not totally out of the question, I could, I could do the calculation and no, check. Yeah. But, but I thought that the whole point of I just did simulation was that if I pretty much all microstates are of this form where OIs are the conserved quantities. Mm -hmm. that's, that's true for all everybody. I mean, pretty much all systems, and it's called to four super angles or anything, is, is guaranteed almost that to have reduce density matrix of this form, but that doesn't 
than just statement of ergodicity. Yeah, okay, yeah, but but to, to get that gravity answer, I think I'm going to have to use additional properties. So I not know. just this, additional properties. Right, but, but are those, that's a... And what are, yeah, I mean, that, that's the question. What are those? What, what could I, we have an idea that you need some constraints on the spectrum of operators and, right. and right. like they're... Right. Well, in view of the time, we should probably uh, wrap this up. So thanks again, Mark.